Lethal Company. Chances are, I don't need to explain this game or its impact in recent months to anyone watching. We all know that Lethal Company is a game that's achieved massive success after its launch in October of 2023, becoming one of the most played games of the year despite only releasing on Steam and only being in early access. Although its visuals and clipping-prone Unity programming may not allude to it, Lethal Company has succeeded in creating an atmosphere of near-constant suspense and a gameplay loop that's as addicting as it is mysterious. From the moment I picked up this title, I knew that I wanted to create a video about it, but there are so many interesting elements and intricacies of the game that I felt something comprehensive was in order. And so that's why I bring to you today the Lethal Company Iceberg, a chart that incorporates elements of the game's lore, mechanics, mysteries, and more into a format organized for obscurity. I've created this iceberg over the last couple of weeks to delve into anything and everything that I've found interesting within the game, and I hope that as we explore it together, Together, you'll find something that you didn't know, too. Now, I spent a lot of time thinking about how I wanted to approach this project while I was putting the iceberg together. I didn't want to overly bore people with the information that's more intuitive, but I also felt that the berg wouldn't be complete if I didn't include it in some way. As such, the first tier is really quite general. It's more or less to make sure that everyone watching is on the same page, but if you're already familiar with all of the stuff that you see here, you're free to skip it. Beyond that, the iceberg is organized in terms of distinct topics and ordered in terms of obscurity, as I already said. You will not see entries for individual creatures, items, or the like unless there's a good reason for them to be there, and once again, I'll go over all of that within the first tier. I also want to thank my good friend Alex, also known as Chicken Nougat on YouTube, for helping me find some of the last-minute additions to the list, and generally just helping me collect footage of stuff I couldn't do on my own. His channel will be linked in the description if you want to check him out. Anyway, I don't want to waste time here in the beginning, after all, we have a lot to talk about today, so with that, let's get started making our way through the full Lethal Company iceberg, starting with our most general entry. This is probably the most surface-level information possible regarding the game, as even people who haven't played Lethal Company probably have an idea of the general synopsis. After all, it's kind of in the name. You are the employee of a nameless, faceless company operating in the distant future. The job of yourself and up to three other friends, or more with mods, is to travel to various different exomoons in order to recover pieces of scrap material to turn into the company in exchange for credits, which go toward offsetting your quota, which you'll need to match or exceed every three days in order to keep your job. While collecting scrap, you'll be subjected to dark, claustrophobic spaces set within procedurally generated environments, and it'll be up to you and your crew to exercise caution, strategic planning, and on-the-fly observation in order to ensure you escape each day with your lives. If you ever complete a three-day cycle without traveling to the company and offloading your scrap material, you'll be subjected to disciplinary action and be fired by way of the ship, automatically opening the airlock and leaving you to float for eternity in the void of space. That's pretty much all there is to it, but don't let the simple premise fool you. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, especially with regard to our next entry. Without a doubt, one of the most mysterious elements of the game is the company, an organization that we only ever really interact with by way of certain functionality on the ship and, of course, when we turn in our scrap. Officially, there's nothing we can definitively say we know about the company, other than the fact that their alleged home base is located on the moon 71 Gordian, which has no natural land masses to speak of and experiences continual storms. Even when turning in scrap, we are never shown to interact directly with anyone at the company. Instead, we leave the material at the window, ring the bell until it opens, and step back as a giant hook or tentacle draws the goods inside. Whatever this appendage may be, we know that it belongs to Jeb, an inhuman creature of some sort that presides within the monolithic structure of the company building. But aside from the fact that he'll become very irritable if annoyed through ringing the bell or making loud vocalizations in front of his open window, there's not much known about Jeb either. The most that any players actually see of him is when they've angered him and he reaches out his his appendage to draw one of them inside. The ship that we use for transport is a company vessel controlled by an autopilot system that will navigate us quickly and efficiently between all of the various locations of interest. 
The vessel is rated to hold four crew members, as signified by a sign found inside, and comes equipped with a number of systems that come in handy throughout our misadventures. Prominent functionality includes the main monitor, used to survey crew members during expeditions, and the terminal, a large system to the right of the monitor that we can use to navigate between worlds, make purchases from the company store, look up information, and more. There are a couple of terminal functions that are particularly important for the sake of this iceberg. The first is the B Bestiary, which holds information pertaining to the various life forms, hostile or otherwise, that you'll encounter while collecting scrap. After you scan a beast, its information will appear in the bestiary. Additionally, typing the word info in front of any of the moons and items within the store will reveal more information about them. At present, these two methods of info seeking are some of the most powerful tools when learning about the world and lore of the game, as well as one other method. Sigurd is the name of a former company employee and crew member of the very same vessel which you now pilot. Throughout his time on the job, Sigurd archived a number of logs within a secret program within the terminal, which can be accessed by typing his name into the system as revealed by a small green sticky note you can find hanging on the wall just left of the machine. Sigurd's first formal log was written on August 20th, 1968, but he also admits to adding information into certain entries of the bestiary prior to documenting his experiences this way. Aside from the first entry, which can be viewed simply by opening the log database, Sigurd's community communications can be found as collectibles in the form of cassettes on various moons, and his logs will help fill in a lot of the gaps of the world that the bestiary or info sections leave to the imagination. So we'll also be revisiting him and his findings quite a few times as this video goes on. At the time of recording, there are a total of nine exomoons to visit in Lethal Company. The first is 71 Gordian, the moon housing the company building that we've already discussed, which is the only one considered safe. Aside from this, there are three easy moons, 41 Experimentation, 220 Assurance, and 56 Vow, two medium difficulty moons, 21 Offense and 61 March, and three hard moons, 85 Rend, 7 Dine, and 8 Titan. On each of these worlds, you and your crew members will encounter encounter the valuable scrap needed to meet your quota and the unspeakable horrors that comprise the bestiary. I have this entry here because I think it's best to disclose all of the different creatures referenced in the bestiary now, as I feel that having a separate entry for each isn't really in the spirit of the iceberg, nor is it particularly productive. At the time this video is being recorded, the full list of creatures that you can scan for information consists of, in no particular order, roaming locusts, manticoils, circuit bees, hygrodeers, brackens, forest keepers, bunker spiders, thumpers, eyeless dogs, jesters, baboon hawks, snare fleas, spore lizards, nutcrackers, coil heads, hoarding bugs, and earth leviathans. There are, however, two entries that can be encountered, but not scanned. Three, if you include Jeb, and each of these creatures will have its own entry lower down. Either way, we'll still be referencing this list of creatures plenty of times when they're relevant to subsequent entries. When you use the terminal to purchase something from the store, unless it's a decoration or costume that stays within the ship, it will be delivered to you the next time you land on a moon via a delivery drone. The drone's landing location differs from moon to moon, but its arrival is always signified by it playing a rendition of the folk song Turkey in the Straw, accompanied by a bright flashing light which can be used to locate it. If you know where the drone lands on your moon, then make sure you're not standing directly underneath it when it touches down, or you'll be crushed. Instead, keep a safe distance, and only after it starts playing its song should you calmly walk forward to retrieve your items. If items are not picked up in a timely manner, the drone will take off again without dropping your stuff, and your purchases will not be refunded by the company. The service manual is an item that exists within the ship, and functions as a sort of general instruction manual for using equipment ranging from your echo scanner to the terminal of the ship and the procedure for turning in scrap to the company, complete with a full list of warnings that'll help you not get eaten by Jeb. It's pretty handy, and you should definitely take some time to give it a read if it's your first shift. 
Zekers is the solo developer responsible for the creation of Lethal Company. They've created a total of three other games on Steam, all themed around horror elements in some way, and they have a fifth experience, Welcome to the Dark Place, on the way. The way that most people know Zekers, though, is not through Steam at all, and rather through Roblox, a game that I had never thought I would have to mention on this channel, but lo and behold, here we are. Even here, Zekers is most well known for their horror experiences, and has garnered quite a following for their legitimately compelling works. Released on December 9th, 2023, version 45, also known as the Frosty Update, is a relatively recent patch that included a lot of new material for the 2023 holiday season, and although it's no longer the most recent update as of recording, its content is significant enough to warrant a brief mention. It's also the version that the game was on for the majority of my time creating this video, so I think it's important to address it in the first tier for a little bit of context. It introduced a number of additions and changes, as revealed in a promotion emotional video, and the patch notes were delivered in a jolly holiday poem format, which is kind of funny. The biggest changes were the addition of the Nutcracker creature type, which is found most frequently on the ice moons Rend and Dine, holiday-themed changes to the Delivery Drone, which now sports Christmas lights, complete with a star at the top, and a new rendition of the Signal Song in the styling of We Wish You a Merry Christmas, as well as the addition of the Spray Paint Can, Signal Translator Ship Upgrade, and the Dramatic Masks, which we'll talk about a little bit further down. As of recording, Lethal Company is on version 49, but this update, as well as the previous one, version 48, are both hotfixes that address small problems from update 47, which is the most recent content update to the game, and which includes several significant changes. The biggest addition by far is the weekly challenge mode, which is a single-player experience that ships players off to a weekly dungeon with the goal of collecting as much scrap as possible in one day's time. Players who participate will find themselves wearing wearing a never-before-seen purple jumpsuit, and you'll probably notice that the amount of scrap found on these challenge moons far exceeds that which can be reasonably expected in a traditional playthrough. Before you ask, though, although these challenge moons may have unique names, they don't have unique layouts. They're basically just reskins of moons that already exist. For example, at the time of recording this footage, the challenge moon had the same layout as Rend, and also, the dungeon interiors are not randomized in these scenarios, despite the game still generating a seed at the beginning of the day. If you survive the whole day and reach the end with scrap in hand, you'll be added to that week's leaderboard, which tracks the efforts of all other participating players. And personally, I find this to be quite the fun and unique way to keep Lethal Company fresh, especially as someone who's found themselves hosting a lot of single player in the pursuit of making this video. Aside from all of this content, though, there's also been some new room types added to certain indoor areas, some alterations to Thumper and Bunker Spider behavior, and a selection of smaller updates that I'm not going to talk about in full here, but which are viewable from the game's Steam page if you're interested. In addition, and this is a fairly trivial and minute detail for an entry on Tier 1, but I'm not sure where else I would mention it, so I feel I should bring it up here. If you were to boot up Steam and view the patch article after Update 47, but before Update 48, less than 24 hours later, the article image, which looks like this, would have instead looked like this, sporting a rendition of Mickey Mouse in the the classic Steamboat Willie style, likely a nod to the character's entry into the public domain as of January 1st, 2024. That has absolutely nothing to do with the content in the update, I just thought it was a weird little addition, and one that changed rather fast. But for now, we're on to Tier 2. Most of the procedurally generated content in Lethal Company is located within the indoor portions of the moons, known as facilities or simply dungeons. However, there are some procedural elements of the experience located in the open environment. One such element are these giant pumpkins, which, while you wouldn't be mistaken to think that there's some level of significance behind their existence, doesn't actually seem to be the case. When you visit a moon, chances are you'll see one or more of these things scattered around, but so far, nobody knows what they are or why they're here. On worlds like Vow or March, they're fairly unassuming, but on more difficult worlds, and specifically Titan, the growths of these things can render entire zones inaccessible or nearly so, making their generation a far less trivial matter. 
Circuit bees are another enemy that occur outdoors on hostile exomoons. Their signature ability is emitting an electrostatic charge that can cause serious harm, thus posing a significant threat to both lone explorers and groups alike. It's by stumbling too close to their hives, located on the ground or atop elevated surfaces, that these beasts are generally provoked. However, the hives themselves can actually prove quite valuable if they can be recovered, which has led to a subset of players intentionally seeking out the boldest and most effective strategies with which to procure them. This has led this particular pursuit to become known as Hive Running, and the players who partake in it, Hive Runners. I've given a try to this myself with some friends, and it's a more difficult pursuit than I had initially thought, so big props to all of the skilled Hive Runners out there. It's not as easy as it may at first seem. Each time the game is launched, users will be treated to a short sequence meant to emulate the look and feel of a system boot screen and startup process on what appears to be a fairly archaic computer system. This system displays some information about the in-universe terminal that we're accessing, with a copyright attributed to Halden Electronics Inc. from the years 2084 to 2108. It advertises a Borson 300 CPU at 2500 MHz and a memory capacity of just over five and a half gigabytes, making this a fairly underpowered machine by today's standards, say nothing of the distant future. There's also something about some connected materials called UTGF devices, but I don't know if anyone's really sure what that means. Either way though, it's a neat little easter egg that gives us a bit more insight into the kind of technology that the company is using. In a similar vein to the boot screen, there's a special splash screen viewable on the terminal only when you have first started the game fresh with no save slots. The screen cannot be obtained again, even if you delete all of your saves and start a new one, unless you also uninstall the entire game, wipe all data from the save and install folder, and then essentially start the game factory new. That being said, since every player who's ever used the terminal has necessarily seen this screen, it ranks high on the iceberg despite its fleeting appearance. The screen itself holds the same copyright information as the boot screen did, and gives us a little bit more information about the terminal's Fortune 9 BIOS, as well as the current date and time, where we learn that the year that the game takes place is actually 2532. The system will then field a couple of preliminary questions, these being your favorite animal and your role in a team dynamic. Your answer to these questions doesn't actually matter from what I can tell, so feel free to input anything you please before you'll be taken to a welcome screen and allowed to use the terminal as normal. Ever since the release of version 47, it seems people have become more interested in or aware of the lore of this game, and with that interest has come a number of resources generated by the community and by news outlets that direct players on how to recover all of the various log tapes which we talked about in Tier 1. However, prior to this point, a surprisingly large part of the Lethal Company community was conflicted as to the actual location or even obtainability of many of these logs in the first place. You had articles from gaming-centric news outlets giving information pertaining to log entries that was misinterpreted or just flat-out wrong, but then you also had players who had seemed to have collected all of the logs but kind of refused to tell anybody where they actually were. This was especially prevalent with the Golden Planet entry in particular for some reason. It was kind of a mess. Anyway, that's not really the point of what I wanted to talk about in this entry. No, instead, it's the number of logs in question that serves as the focal point of this topic. Ever since Sigurd's entries were first data mined, at a point prior to when some of their locations were even public knowledge, it has been known definitively that there were 12 logs present in Lethal Company's files. But during Update 47, that magic number of 12 entries changed for the first time since release. Sitting in between Hiding and Desmond in the chronology, Real Job is the first log to ever be added to Lethal Company via a patch, and with its inclusion, many players have been left wondering how many other missing logs or pieces of lore may be implemented in the future. There are two types of dungeons that can be generated in the game, and have different chances of spawning depending on the moon being explored. These two variations are commonly referred to as the industrial and mansion-style layouts, and each one differs in appearance as well as some generative properties. Industrial types are probably the type that you're most used to seeing. 
These facilities are meant to emulate the look and feel of an industrial corridor system used in something like mining, shipping, or for military purposes. The main material pallets at play are concrete and steel grating, with these types of generations being the ones which lend themselves most to the exteriors of the places in which we visit. Mansion-style layouts, on the other hand, spawn much less frequently on virtually every moon, with the exceptions of Rend and Dine, where their chance of spawning is actually higher than the industrial variant. While industrial facilities open into small chambers with up to three doorways leading to different wings of the location, mansions are immediately recognizable for opening into a large foyer, with an ornate staircase in the middle and a second floor with a much wider selection of hallways to choose from. Aside from the entryway and general theming, each of these dungeon layouts also hosts a completely unique palette of rooms, only accessible within facilities of that type. For example, these weird backlit window rooms only only appear in mansions, while this manufacturing area hosting a slag slide of some sort only appears in the industrial generation. The bestiary entries for several of the game's creatures allude to them having the same taxonomic orders and families of real animals that we're familiar with on Earth. Some of these are kind of obvious, like the circuit bees being related to other species of bees, or the bunker spiders being, well, you know, just a big spider, basically, but some are a little bit more obscure or odd. The thumper, for example, apparently shares the same family as sharks and rays, despite not looking all too similar to either of the those creatures. This does raise some questions about why and how it could even be possible that these otherworldly horrors share such an intimate link with our more mundane animals of Earth, which is a fair enough question, but one that's not all too well understood at this point, and which we'll be exploring again in later tiers of the iceberg. On August 1st, 2023, an official game trailer for Lethal Company was uploaded to Zeker's YouTube channel. The trailer itself appears to be from the perspective of a hiring commercial of some sort, and poses a really fun, almost analog horror aesthetic. There's also some really interesting footage in this thing that stems from the beta version of the game. For example, check out this creature, which looks primarily like a thumper, but has some elements that make it more dog-like in appearance. The trailer is definitely worth a watch. It's chock full of interesting beta images, and I'll put a link to it in the description, in case it's something that you're interested in checking out further for yourself. Perhaps the largest unsolved anomaly in this game is the significance of this object, hidden underneath the landing area of the company building and accessible via the same trapdoor that's used to find the screams behind the wall's log. In order to reach this hidden area, you have to do a bit of clever jumping, and the goal is basically to continue working your way into this system of girders and scaffolding until you reach a platform, which will contain the object as well as a lever hanging from the ceiling that can be used to flick on a light switch. Many people presume that this object, which seems to be a drill of some kind, alludes to future content yet to be added to the game, in which we'll be able to use two apparatuses in order to power on this system and allow it to punch through the wall of the company, right where this circle is spray-painted. The setup of the area in its current form doesn't leave a lot to the imagination in terms of what its purpose may be, but there are still a number of remaining questions, such as who put this here, and if or or when we'll actually be able to use it. When you visit the company to turn in scrap and make your quota, you have the option to turn in gear you purchased from the store just the same as any other materials. If you do this, Jeb will scoop up the gear just the same, but you won't be awarded any credits for collecting it. Generally, there's not really any conceivable reason to do this, but I guess it is an option if you're trying to get rid of something that you bought accidentally. Most of the time, I'd advise against it and just suggest that you save those things until they can be used more effectively, though most players, I imagine, have discovered this the hard way instead, by placing down a material that they had in their offhand by accident. 
There are currently two types of monsters in the game that cannot be scanned and are therefore unlisted in the bestiary. The first of these mobs is the Ghost Girl, the rarest and certainly one of the most intriguing enemy encounters in the entire game. Manifesting as the stereotypical little girl you might see in a horror movie like The Shining, this creature is unique since they're not visible to all players, and instead will haunt a single player at a time while remaining undetectable to everyone else. She's a really interesting encounter that's bound to freak people out when they first discover her, and remains a challenging adversary even for experienced players. The other mob is the Masked, or Mimic, which spawns as a player wearing one of the dramatic mask items that I mentioned in the Holiday Update section. The masks themselves are actually a fairly common drop, especially on harder moons. There are two variants, Comedy and Tragedy, both of which can be picked up, moved, and dropped without any issue. But the danger begins begins when pressing the left mouse button while holding one, which causes the player to raise the mask to their face as if putting it on. The comedy mask is a lot more forgiving in this regard, allowing you to hold it up for multiple seconds at a time in many cases without any problem, though it can result in the object taking over your body and turning you into one of the masked. The Tragedy Mask, on the other hand, will start the transformation sequence as soon as the left mouse button is clicked. One more thing that I realized I forgot to mention while wrapping up this section is that while you're in possession of some of these masks, they may periodically let out some strange ambient noises, such as a devious laugh or a sharp inhaling sound meant to seem like crying. As a masked, a player will die, but their body will become the host of the mask itself, which will wander around in a fashion similar to a zombie, and attempt to grab other players to turn them into masked as well. As mentioned earlier though, entities that look like masked crew members can also spawn independently on the moon's rend and titan. Finally, both of these unscannable mobs, the ghost girl and the masked, are the only creatures in the entire game that can spawn in and travel between indoor and outdoor spaces. Forest Keepers and Brackens, while very different enemies on the surface, are apparently thought to share a familial link. This can be pieced together with information from both of the species bestiary entries. First is the Bracken, which is referred to with the scientific name Rapex folium. Next, if we toggle over to the entry for the Forest Keepers, it's stated that they are believed to share a familiar ancestor with Rapex folium, ergo, the Forest Keepers and Brackens probably are related. Interesting stuff. Ever wondered what happens to the scrap that you leave at 71 Gordian? Well, a common theory is that Jeb, the creature that accepts the material in the first place, actually just eats it, and the process of feeding Jeb is basically the entire goal of the company. This one kind of goes beyond the territory of pure theory though, as it's actually referenced by Sigurd as being the definitive reason that we're doing all of this work. The only reason that I personally consider this a theory at all is because at present, we're missing some of the more nuanced information as to just how Sigurd and the crew came to the realization that this is what scrap was being used for to begin with. Me personally, I'd say that this one is all but confirmed, and a lot of people have derived this conclusion on their own as well, so maybe the biggest secret of the company isn't really as much of a secret as we'd originally thought. Many of the monster encounters that Lethal Company has to offer are, much like the game itself, easy to learn but difficult to master. Each creature type has a different and distinct gimmick, and while learning those gimmicks is generally quite easy and intuitive, it's the creativity of how you respond to those threats that will define whether your crew lives or dies. Most of the time, we think of negating these threats in terms of escaping from the creatures themselves, but the game also has you covered if you're feeling a bit more on the offensive. There are several weapons and pseudo-weapons within the game that can stand to really help you out in a bind, most of which are actually not that difficult to find in the first place. First, there's the shovel and the various types of signs, all of which can be used for melee combat. There's actually a lot of enemies that can be killed with just a couple of well-placed strikes, such as the bracken, the thumper, or the snare flea. So, this can be a pretty good way to ensure the safety of your team if you're able to get these guys into a position where attacking is a viable option. 
Next, there's a small selection of weapons that can be used not to damage enemies, but simply to deter them while you make your escape or get into an attack position. These are the Stun Grenade, which can be purchased from the company store, and the DIY Flashbang, which has a chance to spawn as scrap on some moons. They're very similar objects, except for the fact that the Stun Grenade will persist after use, whereas the Flashbang will not. There's also the Zap Gun, which, as its name suggests, is a gun that can be used to temporarily inhibit some enemies with an electric shock. Finally, though, there's the double barrel, which is far and away the hardest weapon to acquire, but also the most lethal. You can't simply buy one of these like you can with a shovel or a stun gun. Instead, the double barrel is exclusively dropped by nutcrackers, who themselves take four to five shovel hits to neutralize. This thing is pretty powerful, though, and if you have enough shells, you'll be able to blast your way through more of the game's unholy creatures than ever before. A word of advice, though. Make sure that before you drop or reload the double barrel that the safety is turned on. If it's not, there's a small chance that the weapon will fire on its own, which wastes valuable ammo, creates a loud noise that can draw in enemies, and potentially can result in you accidentally killing your own teammate. As we've already discussed, there's a lot that you can accomplish within the terminal, from buying items to scanning a facility for loot and more. But the terminal system comes with an odd quirk, this being that it generally only recognizes the first three letters that you input, except in specialized circumstances. This leads to a lot of shorthand codes being permitted just the same as their longer variations. For example, the next time you want to purchase a Pro flashlight from the store, you can save yourself some time by simply typing Pro and and confirming your choice. In fact, this confirm option can just be shortened to the letter C. The same principle also applies to many of the bestiary entries, choosing a moon, or even Sigurd's logs. The list of use cases here goes on and on, and it's also worth noting that most of the time, it also doesn't matter if you're putting additional letters after those initial three, as long as the first three are in the proper order. This makes it possible to do all kinds of weird stuff, like travel to the moon Rend by typing rental car, but it can also result in some interactions with the terminal being moderately annoying, such as when I went to take the bunk beds out of storage and typed bunk bed singular without the S, which led to the bestiary entry for the bunker spider being displayed instead. The apparatus is one of the few pieces of scrap that I think deserves its own spot on the iceberg, being as it is a rather unique collectible within the game. The apparatus can only spawn in specific rooms within industrial facilities, and unlike most scrap, they're thought to serve an actual purpose within the facilities that they're found. You see, the apparatus is a power source, and once removed from the wall, it'll cause all light in that facility to shut off permanently, meaning you'll have to explore in complete darkness until you leave the moon at the end of the day. When it's pulled from the wall, the apparatus will also trigger this message to appear in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, denoting an increased health risk due to radiation exposure in the order of 70 millisieverts. For context, 100 millisieverts is the recommended limit for radiation exposure in a professional environment over the course of five years. From a lore perspective, that can't be good. But in terms of gameplay, the message is actually pretty much inconsequential. The more pressing issue is that once one of these has been yanked from the wall, there's a 70% chance that two monsters will instantly spawn somewhere in the facility so you'll need to be extra careful when toting an apparatus back to the ship. If collected, they're valued at 80 credits, and as mentioned earlier, may have something to do with the mysterious drill object underneath the company platform in a later update. When traveling to the moon Vow, you'll likely have noticed that there is a total of three different pathways that can be used to access the facility. To the right, players can simply follow the terrain and work their way around the divot sitting in front of the entrance. It can take a while and isn't ideal if there are monsters about, but it does the job. To the left is a bridge fashioned atop a big concrete wall or dam, at the bottom of which the fire escape can actually be found. The structure provides a stable walkway, and it's actually here where Sigurd's Law 
blog entitled Screams can be recovered. Far and away the fastest route, though, is using the Central Bridge, which takes you directly across the chasm and right to the main entrance. But this bridge has a very noticeable drawback. When players are landed on Vow, the game employs an algorithm to determine the durability of the bridge. Whenever players are standing upon the bridge, its durability will decrease at a steady rate, a rate which becomes more dramatic when more players, or players carrying more than 11 pounds, are on the bridge at any given time. If and when the bridge has taken enough strain to cause its durability counter to decrease to zero, it will collapse, taking with it any players that are on the structure at the time. Don't worry, the fall is definitely survivable, but you'll have to trek out of the ravine in order to find your way back, and from here on out, all players will have to take one of the ulterior routes to enter and exit the facility. It should be noted that players aren't the only entities that can cause the bridge to degrade, as a monster standing atop the bridge will actually cause it to lose durability faster than most player scenarios. Finally, if you and your crew have an inkling that the bridge may have taken a lot of strain recently, it really does pay to leave it alone, as any time a player is not standing on the bridge, it will actually gain back durability, and in time, may even become a safe and accessible option again, which could prove valuable later in the run. Added in version 45, Arachnophobia mode is an accessibility option in Lethal Company settings that, as its name suggests, changes the model of the bunker spider so as not to strike fear into any legitimately arachnophobic players. That being said, if you're anything like me, then upon seeing this addition in the patch, you might have been asking yourself, well, how in the hell is this even going to work? I mean, what are they actually going to do? Remove the model of the spider and just replace it with the word spider or something like that? Well, I'll be damned. Yeah, it's admittedly kind of funny. I'm not really sure how many people legitimately use this setting, but either way, it is an interesting little toggle, and if nothing else, it certainly does let you know exactly what you're looking at, so I guess that's to be celebrated at least. Chances are, while you've been exploring a dungeon, you probably noticed these grates near the floor on the wall. But although they may seem purely decorative, there's a lot more to these things than some players may even realize. You see, grates are actually a fundamental part of the game's spawning process for indoor monsters. And while I'm not going to go into extreme detail about the spawn mechanics of Lethal Company at this time, it essentially works like this. When the lever on the ship is pulled and a seed is chosen to start a new day, a selection of entities are are prepared, and one by one, they're assigned to the grates lining the indoor portion of the moon. They're also given a value that decides the order in which those grates will spawn their respective creature. When it's time for a grate to release the entity inside, it'll visibly switch from a closed to open state. That's right, every time you've seen one of these open grates, it means that one of the game's monsters has already spawned from it. But scarier still are the closed grates, which suggest that the game still has a monster waiting to be released at any moment. Moment. With that though, let's move on to Tier 3. Desmond was a member of Sigurd's crew, and is likely the most narratively important member aside from Sigurd himself. Generally, if people can name one other person on the crew other than Sigurd, it's probably him. Desmond has been shown to have had something of a knack for working the computer systems aboard the ship, a talent which led him to most often be the guy responsible for opening doors and coordinating movement between the other three crew members during their expeditions. It was also revealed in the log titled Desmond, which is the last of Sigurd's chronological entries, that he is the reason we have access to these files today, as he was forward-thinking enough to encrypt them, to prevent them from being wiped from the ship after the crew disappeared due to mysterious circumstances. In the log titled Screams, Sigurd mentions that he's able to hear screams from inside of the company building, using the walkie-talkie. Many players have wondered if these screams are actually audible within the game itself, and interestingly, the answer is still sort of inconclusive. There's a strong subset of people that believe that wailing sounds are emanating from inside the facility, but flicking on the walkie-talkie doesn't actually change anything, and there's no sound that comes through the walkie when you're at the facility, at least least in my findings. I tried using the walkie-talkie in a number of different locations and under a variety of circumstances as well. I tried it on the ship, I tried it in front of Jeb's window, I even tried it by the drill, and heard nothing. If any of you have experienced something different though, be sure to let me know. 
Inside the ship, there's a poster that reveals a phone number, which employees are to call if the drone ship is experiencing technical difficulties, and many have speculated that this number might be part of some kind of ARG or allude to a cool easter egg related to the game. Alas though, everyone who's tried it has always come up with the same answer, this being that the number is unlisted, and therefore, it doesn't actually lead anywhere. This is a theory that relates back to a principle that we mentioned earlier, this being that the species of creatures we find in lethal company often relate back to real species of Earth. But this theory takes it a step further, and posits the idea that because we never see any of the biological counterparts to the game's many monsters, they may no longer exist by the time that the game takes place. The issue with this theory, though, is that there's no real evidence to substantiate it. In this case, the absence of evidence can't really be used as evidence itself, since our view into the world of Lethal Company is fairly constrained, but perhaps more damningly, there actually is an Earth species that we can interact with in the game, the Goldfish, which can be purchased as a decoration for your ship for 50 credits. The fact that the Goldfish exists at all throws a bit of a wrench into this theory, but since we never see a shark or a normal bee or a spider, I guess it is still possible with regards to these specific species. Throughout your travels to the exomoons, you probably have noticed that many share a similar theme. Moons like Experimentation, Assurance, and Offense all have a desert motif, Vow and March could be described as swamp or jungle moons, and of course Rend and Dine are host to the dreaded blizzards. But what you may not know is that the similarities in climate and theme are actually explained within the lore. By exploring the info page for each of these moons in the terminal, we can learn that Offense is believed to have actually once been a part of Assurance, which the game describes as its cousin moon, and that Assurance and Experimentation are twin moons discovered at a similar point in time. Apparently, all three of these moons orbit a gas giant known as Big Grin. This is far and away the moon system that has the most information about it, but while we may not have a name for the planets or systems that the others orbit, we still know their relations with one another. The entry for March states that this moon is often overlooked due to its twin moon Vow, and the entries for Dine and Rend are exactly the same, with both saying that they orbit a white dwarf star, and due to their identical entries, I'm going to allege that that star is probably one in the same for both. The television is an item you can buy in Lethal Company to decorate your ship, and as you would expect, you can turn it on and view a small selection of programs that loop every minute or so. There's a cartoon where a crew member is struck by lightning, a brief pass over a desert moon with some music, and even footage of real-life kittens. But there's also one other program, and it's probably the most interesting thing you can find on the air, a self-defense tutorial that seems to have been commissioned or produced by the company itself. If an entity has come in contact with a crew member, please refrain from immediate self-defense. Instead, ask the crew member the following. Is the entity being aggressive? Are you injured? Do you need assistance? If the answer to all of these questions is yes, you begin your self-defense measures. If the crew member is stressed, strike a question like, How was your day? Thank you for your cooperation and happy travels. Players that have experience playing with the jetpack, especially if you're messing around in a single-player lobby, will probably at some point figure out that it's actually surprisingly easy to take this thing out of bounds on just about every moon. From my brief exploration on the moons Assurance, March, and Rend, there's not much to see out there, but either way, it's an interesting little pastime and a good bit of fun that I recommend everyone who enjoys using the jetpack try out at least once. There can be no doubt that the Jester is likely to be the creature type that has the highest capacity for ending your run instantly. Despite looking like something Sid would have brewed up in the original Toy Story, well-versed players know that this is one of the worst sights to see on your moon. In this form, the Jester is completely harmless. The most it'll do is follow you around and stay quiet. It's actually kind of fun for the first couple of seconds to have a weird little companion by your side, but all of that changes when the Jester starts winding. 
As it does, a warped and distorted rendition of Pop Goes the Weasel will begin to play, and it's at this point that if you ever hear this song, you should immediately begin seeking an exit as soon as possible. After approximately 40 seconds from the start of the tune, the jester will pop, resulting in a fleshy appendage sporting a massive skull to emerge from its top. It'll start to chase whatever player it was near when it started winding, and gradually gain speed over time, quickly starting to move at a pace which even an unenamored crew member can't outrun at full stamina. This makes the jester virtually inescapable, unless you're fleetingly close to the exit of the dungeon, and it doesn't stop after killing just one player either. Once its initial target was either taken down or removed themselves from the building, the jester will pick another crew member in the facility at random, and begin pursuing them regardless of distance. It will do this until every person inside the dungeon is either dead or has a evacuated, at which point after a short time, it'll return to its unpopped state and you could theoretically enter the dungeon again, although this process will repeat as long as there are players left on the moon. The reason that I explain this encounter in such depth, though, is because there is a potential way to buy you and your team some time if you find yourself in a scenario where one of these guys is nearby. If you happen to possess a stun gun while a jester begins winding, take aim at it once it starts the song. If done correctly, this can stun the jester for up to 20 seconds before it will resume winding and continue playing. This, in essence, gives you 50% more time in which you can find and communicate with the rest of your team that they need to leave, and while if you're spread thin, this tip probably won't make the encounter manageable, 20 seconds can go a long way in a game like Lethal Company. The Survival Kit is a collection of items that can be purchased from the ship's terminal, which isn't actually listed on the store page at the time of recording. The Survival Kit is always available for purchase, and it contains four flashlights, four walkie-talkies, and one shovel for a price of 138 credits. The only reason anyone knows this exists at all is because it's referenced in the service manual, so unless you've read that or watched a video like this one, this pack is completely hidden from most players. Snare fleas are a more dangerous monster than a lot of explorers give them credit for. They lurk on the ceiling and leap down onto the heads of passerby, often taking them by surprise. If you're exploring with at least one other person, then an encounter with a snare flea is not a particularly dire situation, so long as your comrade is holding a shovel or a sign, as it can simply be smacked off. But if you're exploring alone, one of these landing on your head is pretty much a death sentence. With that being said, though, owing to their main method of negation, essentially being by squishing them, it seems that many crews, including Sigurds, have become all too familiar with the Snare Flea's internal biology, since Sigurd went out of his way to comment in the bestiary entry for these things that their insides might make a good milkshake. I don't even know what to say about this one, it's just kinda gross. Many have speculated that the company as we know them in the game goes by a different name in-universe, one that we're shown repeatedly several times as a matter of fact, and which, if the theory stands, could be said to be hiding in plain sight. The strongest piece of evidence to suggest this probably comes from the service manual, which boasts copyright information not simply for the company, but for Halden Electronics, the same firm that we know to have built the terminal aboard the ship. It's also one of, if not the only other business organizations we know of in the Lethal Company universe, so there's a strong case to be made that Halden Electronics and the company are the same thing. While potentially a visual fright, spore lizards are some of the safest creatures to encounter. With a familial link to alligators, spore lizards are completely herbivorous, and are definitely more scared of you than you are of them. These big reptiles will always try and avoid conflict where possible, slinking out of view before turning tail and running away. Although if cornered, they'll release a cloud of purple spores from their tails and will potentially bite in self-defense, though not with the intent to feed. Being as they are a very timid creature, they're the only monster in this game with a presumed historical link to at least partial human domestication. It's unclear exactly what, if anything, people stood to gain by keeping spore lizards, though. Maybe it was as simple as wanting to have them as pets, or maybe they ate away harmful plants. 
Who knows? Sadly, though, the story goes that the domestication effort was, quote, set aside by an initiative to harvest their tails for their medicinal properties. This actually makes me kind of sad. We could have been good friends with these guys, and instead, we had to go and cut them up for their parts. That's just kind of dismal. In a similar vein to spore lizards, hygro deers are also a pretty non-threatening encounter. These slow-moving blobs are composed of multitudinous microorganisms, and although they are technically hostile, they're so slow and clumsy as to be pretty much ineffective at actually harming a player in most circumstances. If you find yourself cornered by a hygro deer, you've got a lot of options. One is to just have another player place a boombox on the ground, and the creature will begin to move toward it, eventually kind of dance on top of it, a behavior that was also recorded by Sigurd in the related bestiary entry. Alternatively, you can just kind of close it behind a door and it won't be able to get out, or hop up on a railing to move past it. One of the more interesting things about the Hygro Deer, though, is its name. At first glance, it kind of just seems like a nonsense term that wouldn't have a whole lot of subtext, but in reality, Hygro Deer is a Latin term which means to get wet, a title that's definitely befitting of this amorphous goo. Let's talk a little bit more about what we can learn from Sigurd's logs, specifically one entitled Nonsense. This log builds off of a story arc started in an earlier entry titled Goodbye, which took place on September 7th, 1968. In Goodbye, Sigurd reveals that Richard, another member of the crew, was left behind on one of the moons after being killed by a bracken. Then, in Screams, which takes place five days later, Sigurd tells us that he was the one to call the company in order to report Rich's death, but can't get over the fact that the voice he spoke with on the phone was the same canned audio that seems to come out of the speaker at the company building, as well as over the ship loudspeaker. Finally, all of this culminates in nonsense, where it's revealed that Desmond traced the phone call, leading to the discovery that the call was not issued from the company building at all. Instead, its source was located across the solar system, in the opposite direction, meaning that whoever is behind the company, or at least responsible for fielding calls is effectively as far away as reasonably possible from the work actually being done on their behalf. It's probably one of the biggest and most significant reveals in all of Sigurd's adventures, and most players who've taken a look at the logs will probably be familiar with this story beat, even if they aren't familiar with all of the other material leading up to it. Getting jumped by a coil head can be one of the most nerve-wracking encounters this game has to offer, and for good reason. These things work pretty much identically to the Weeping Angels of Doctor Who fame or the original SCP, number 173, the statue. If you're not familiar with either of those examples, though, then I'm happy to say that the concept is extremely simple. As long as you have the coil head in your line of sight, there's nothing that it can do. It'll stand completely immobile, with perhaps the sole exception being its head, which may bob back and forth since it's on a spring. However, the moment you take eyes off of the being, it will begin to move in your direction at a frightening pace. These things are fast, and it's no wonder that they're so feared, since it causes your team to have to coordinate vision in very specific ways in order to make sure that everyone can exit the facility alive. Anyway, chances are you probably will have either died of a coil head yourself, or have had one of your team members killed by one at some point in time. But since many players don't want to deal with them for longer than they absolutely have to, it's actually fairly rare to find the body of a player killed by a coil head. If you do find the body, though, you're in for a surprise. What you'll find is a Frankensteinian desecration, with the arms of the deceased removed and their heads placed upon a spring to emulate the coil head's own image. It's an off-putting sight, but at least one which immediately signifies what it is they've died to. So, if you find one of these while playing with your friends or in a public lobby, be on your guard, as there's almost certainly a dangerous entity just outside of your line of sight. Most of the time, it's difficult to get an unimpeded view of the game's skybox, but some moons like Titan may cause you to wonder what's on the horizon, and, well, it's this. This is the backdrop to most or every area within the game. There's not much else to say about this one, I just found it kind of funny. 
Although an interesting feature of the game, the company buy rate is not something that the average player needs to overly take into consideration. If you're turning in your scrap on the last day of the deadline, then the company will always purchase your goods at a rate of 100% their value. So, unless you're someone who wants to turn in scrap a couple of days early, there's almost never any reason to actually think about this feature. However, what some players may not know is that there is a time when the company may actually be buying your scrap at a rate over market value or in other words, higher than 100%. But it's not going to help you very much in your runs. You see, the only time when you can actually see this increased pay rate, at least to my knowledge, is when you've failed to meet a quota. If you're looking at the Moons page during the very brief period of time after you've left Gordian, but before you've been ejected from the ship, you'll see the increased buy rate of 123%. To my knowledge, there's no way to actually get to Gordian with this pay rate and make any extra cash, considering this is the only time when such a scenario arises, but it's still kind of a fun little easter egg taunting us as one of the last things we see before being flung into the void. Sigurd's dad is another character who we hear about through the collectible logs, and although we never really hear of any of the characters' actions directly, we do get some insight into them and Sigurd's relationship with him at rare points within the story. For the majority of my time creating this video, I had Sigurd's dad one tier lower on the iceberg than he is now, but I decided to bring him up a little bit with the release of the Real Job log with Update 47. The reason being because this log actually offers a lot of information about the character and and really about the state of the world of Lethal Company as a whole at the time that the log takes place in 1968. I'm going to read the latter half of the entry now, and we're going to be discussing it later as well, so I figure it's a good time to go over this thing either way. The latter half of the log reads, I miss Dad. I hope he isn't staying on Titan. People are saying it's not going to look the same in two years. Jess told us they're about to go to war, and everyone is waiting for it. Every time we go to sell, the company building is shaking like there's a loud furnace inside. They're too afraid to quit. We can barely sleep to meet the quota, and it gets worse every time. God, I feel like I'm being squeezed through a needle. I wish we could go back. It was better working for Dad, even when I got nothing, just daily allowance. I liked when he would drive us out of town to see the waterfall, and we walked up those wooden stairs. I just wanted a real job. Now I know that's kind of a loaded entry, especially if you're someone who's been playing for a while and this is your first time hearing it, but in terms of Sigurd's dad, from my perspective, there's really two different ways to interpret his part here. Either his father lived on the Moon Titan before Sigurd went to work at the company, or his dad simply worked there and they lived elsewhere. It isn't really clear. Either way though, we know that Sigurd worked for him before leaving for the job at the company. But other than that, there isn't much known about this man at all, and Sigurd doesn't seem to have a chance to tell us before he and his crew mysteriously disappear. Eyeless dogs can be a pretty fearsome foe. They're large, carnivorous beings with gaping mouths appearing outside on just about every moon, and the only way to really work around them is to remain completely silent and hope that they don't just stumble into you. Dogs can quickly ruin a good time and take out a couple of crewmates in the process if they wander into your ship, but luckily their nature as a sound-driven being is fairly easily exploitable. In particular, there are two key ways that objects in the environment can be used to your advantage. One clever tactic that can be used to draw a dog away from the ship is to order something inexpensive from the store, in hopes that the sound emitted by the delivery drone may draw them away. This is a fairly popular tactic, but there's another prominent interaction that's a lot harder to engineer to your advantage, but which is still worth a mention. What I'm referring to is the rare sight of an eyeless dog coming into contact with a baboon hawk, a territorial creature with a Cthulhu-esque head that honks like a goose when it feels threatened. In this case, that honk is particularly important, being as it is a loud and prominent sound which has the ability to enrage a dog just as the noise from a player would. This can honestly result in a pretty amusing little display, one which highlights the agility of the baboon hawk as they dodge back and forth between the eyeless dog's clumsy advancements. Now it's on to tier 4. 
This theory attempts to explain the desolation of the moons that we visit within the game, by positing the idea that since each one was abandoned, perhaps there was some kind of stellar conflict in the past which is to blame for all the desolation. What makes this theory particularly interesting, though, is that as information has been added to the game over time, more and more evidence has surfaced that seems to support this conclusion. It started with the bestiary entry for the Coil Head, which posits the idea that these monsters may have first been developed as biological weapons of war, and yet we weren't given any indication of what conflicts in question they may have been used in. However, as of update 47, we now know that the Moon Titan was expected to go to war with somebody in or around 1970, which might give us some idea as to where the coil heads could have been deployed. Bear in mind, there still isn't a whole lot to explain how a conflict on Titan would have translated to the rest of the worlds that we see in the game, but it certainly is a start. The Thistle Nebula is a location mentioned in many bestiary entries within the game, but one for which not much information actually exists. It's insinuated that the Thistle Nebula is the place where all of the moon systems of Lethal Company are located, and therefore also the region of space where the game takes place, though this is never outright confirmed, just heavily implied. One of the few characteristics of the place that we're given to work with is the wide variety of ecosystems found on the moons hosted in the nebula. Ecosystems which have played an integral part in the creation of the various diasporas and offshoots of Earth creatures found throughout the game. According to the entry for the Bunker Spider, it seems that this increased speciation took place after a vessel or object known as the Boat seeded Earth life around the nebula, which is certainly an interesting area of the lore, but sadly one for which this is the only real mention. In other words, aside from acknowledging the Boat's existence, there's not that much else to say about it. Stormy is one of the four weather conditions that can arise on any of the moons that you visit. Much like the company's pay rate, this condition fluctuates hourly, and changes each time you board your ship at the end of each day. When landing on a moon that's currently stormy, there may be reduced visibility due to rain, but more pressingly, any metal items will have a well-telegraphed chance of being struck by lightning, at which point if you're holding or simply near those items, you'll be instantly killed. However, solid cover can and will negate the effects of lightning even if you're loaded up with all the metal in the world, so while you may hear the accompanying sparking noises if you're inside a dungeon or the ship, the lightning will never actually be able to harm you. However, the bolt will still hit the ship's roof, and if this happens, it'll cause the lights in the ship to go out. This can also happen at random, and don't worry, the lights can be turned back on. Pretty easily, in fact. All you have to do is flick the light switch on the wall, and everything will go back to normal. But chances are, if you've landed on a stormy moon, and you return to your ship later to find the power off, then a lightning strike is probably to blame. Golden Planet is the name of one of Sigurd's logs, and is the only log for which an exact date is unknown. It's regarded as probably the weirdest and most out there log of the bunch, which is kind of saying something considering some of the other documents we've already talked about. It's so weird, in fact, that I'm actually going to read it to you in full, and then we'll discuss. But know that I've also done my best in my narration to correct some of the spelling and grammatical errors, so while I'll show the text in its original form on screen, you may find that you're interpreting it a little bit differently than I am, just let that be known. I talked to a voice on the walkie-talkie. It was like a part of the screams. He told me the golden planet actually existed. It's not a legend. And he told me it didn't just hit a meteor. He said the planet was swallowed up by the beast, and they were in its body being digested. I asked what the beast is, and he said he didn't know. He said it ate the planet, and they forgot everything. I couldn't get him to stop talking, but I said he was on the other side of a big wall, and I could get him out. I said he was inside the building, and that's when he started freaking out. I couldn't make out a word. I think he said something about spitting out the rinds, so I just turned it off. What a whack. Jess says the golden planet is just a story. I said, I know, I'm not an idiot. Well, she said I should quit, and she quits if I do, so she's staying. 
I think this is probably the most mysterious of Sigurd's entries, but also arguably the one with the most important lore implications. And that's because we get a look at some of the in-universe folklore and legends which permeate this game. From the look of things, the Golden Planet is a somewhat well-known legend, maybe akin to something like El Dorado. Apparently, the story details that the planet was hit by a meteor at some point in the past, but this person who Sigurd managed to contact on the walkie-talkie from outside of the company building instead said that the planet was eaten by the beast, or presumably Jeb, and that its residents are being digested in the beast's stomach. There's a lot of questions that I have after reading this, and you probably do as well, none of which I'm going to even try and answer right now. I might leave that for its own dedicated video sometime down the line, I'm not sure. But just to name a few of those questions, what kind of beast could Jeb be to swallow an entire planet as well as its whole population? What's going on in the company building that allows for an entire planet's mass to somehow be stored in there, and what about the whole memory loss undertone that was mentioned seemingly at random? It's all interesting stuff, but it's also stated by Sigurd that since he's outside of the facility, he might be able to find a way to get that voice out of there, which has led me to believe that he may have been the one responsible for planting the drill that we discussed earlier. That's only a theory though, and other than this one document, I don't really have any further evidence to back it up, though I think the possibility is rather compelling either way. We briefly mentioned the Forest Keepers earlier in this video. They're massive, completely deaf giants that will hunt down players by sight, and if captured, that player will be eaten, at which point other crew members are left to either flee the scene or watch on in abject terror. While most of us probably see the former as the more productive and sensible option, it turns out that there may be some legitimate reasons to hang around while one of your crew members is being devoured, as apparently there's an incredibly small chance for a giant to emit something called a stink cloud, which is a type of fog that can be generated by giants who are digesting. The stink cloud allegedly causes obstruction of vision and results in a loss of stamina and health, but the kicker here is that the random chance of this occurring is apparently extremely low. I'm not sure of the exact numbers, and from what I've found, they haven't been published publicly online if they are known, but I recruited my friend to help me try and farm the effect using a modded client, and after around an hour, we still couldn't get the effect to spawn. The Forest Keeper page on the Lethal Company fandom wiki suggests that perhaps these red blood clouds are actually the source of the loss of stamina and life, and indeed, it doesn't seem that the substance emitted by the giant during feeding is always necessarily blood. So perhaps there is some legitimacy to this idea, but so far, any attempts to replicate the stink cloud effect myself haven't been particularly successful. I'll keep people updated in the comments and the description, though, if I do manage to get it. I know that we just talked about memory loss a minute or so ago with regard to Golden Planet, but as it turns out, this is kind of a recurring theme within a lot of Sigurd's logs, and seems to be a phenomenon that's inexplicably linked with the company itself. In Golden Planet, there's obviously the notion that Jeb or whatever other beasts lurk inside the company building might have an innate ability linked to memory loss when they digest people, but there are plenty of other times when memory loss appears as a theme. In the log Hiding, for example, Sigurd writes, writes, quote, I started wondering how I can't remember how we got here. Now I just remember little things, like the shuttle flight to the building where we signed our contracts, but I don't remember getting on the shuttle. I don't even remember saying bye to dad. In my dreams, it feels like the company isn't trapped in there at all. It's just hiding. I don't know if I'm going home. From everything we can tell, Sigurd and the rest of the crew have never experienced any kind of digestion or encounter with Jeb outside of the ordinary, so it's kind of puzzling that memory loss would be a factor here at all. It's really intriguing, but at the moment, the reason behind this seemingly paranormal lapse in memory remains unknown. The insanity value is an internal variable within Lethal Company's code that's used in a couple of in-game systems. The value is based primarily off of location, and increases at a constant rate for all players depending on where they are. Inside the ship, insanity increases at the slowest rate, at only 0.2 points per cycle, while players inside of the building will have their insanity increase at the fastest rate, 0.8 points per cycle. Players outside will also gain insanity at different rates 
depending on if it's before or after sundown. And in a single player game, many of these variables are changed and simplified to more accurately cater to the experience. The actual function that the insanity value serves is quite simple. It's used to select the ambient sounds that play within dungeons throughout your time on the moon, but it's also used as a deciding factor in which player will first be haunted by the ghost girl if she is to appear. This theory is exactly what it sounds like. Some people believe that the company has the ability to revive crew members from the dead, and this is meant to give an in-universe explanation to the phenomenon of any player that died during the course of the day coming to life and appearing within the ship again at the day's end. The supposed evidence for this kind of comes in two parts, as the process involved in reviving a crew member really breaks down into the revival itself and getting them back onto the ship. The latter part of this is no problem. We already know that teleportation technology exists in this world. Both the teleporter and inverse teleporter are fairly accessible pieces of technology that company employees can work with if they purchase them from the store. The other factor, though, that of revival, is quite a bit harder to prove. It's thought by those that believe this theory that since a steep fee is applied to any bodies which are not recovered at a day's end, that this cost may actually be necessary in order to implement some kind of secret proprietary resurrection technology that the company possesses and can use remotely. If you couldn't tell by now though, I don't personally believe in this theory myself, and the reason why is primarily because of the death of Richard as detailed in Sigurd's logs. When Rich died, Sigurd had to contact the company and a replacement member was sent to them in a process which spanned several weeks. If the technology had existed, then it would be reasonable to assume that Rich would have simply been revived and returned to the middle of the ship just the same as any else. That being said, it's important to remember that Sigurd's logs take place about 500 years before the events of the game, so it is possible that more technology has developed in that time, although pretty much everything else we know about the company has stayed almost exactly the same. Below the patch notes of the announcement for Update 45, Zekers wrote the following. Quote, for compatibility with mods, you can opt into the previous branch on Steam to play the older version. This alludes to a function in Steam's beta menu which allows players of participating games to opt into various legacy versions or branches at their own discretion. In the case of Lethal Company, there is of course the previous branch as mentioned in the post, but there's also another version, which is perhaps even more interesting. By selecting Public Beta, the opportunity to experience a working snapshot of an unreleased version of the game is awarded to you. Full disclosure, originally in this section I was going to talk about many of the same features as are now present in Update 47, since at the time of recording this section, Update 47 was not committed to the main branch of the game yet, and was only playable by accessing the beta. But I have to say, it's been pretty cool seeing that update evolve and finally get pushed to the general player base. So if you're into the idea of experiencing features like this before they see widespread release, then the beta branch might just be for you. Check it out, it's pretty cool. There are two different pieces of scrap in the game that are unique to specific moons. This means that they can only be encountered and collected on a single world, and nowhere else, without the use of cheats or mods. These two items are the dustpan, found solely on experimentation, and the chemical jug, exclusive to Vow. Neither of these items is particularly assuming, but I will say that I find the chemical jug the more interesting of the two, solely for the fact that the label on the side indicates that the vessel is filled with acid tone, which, if you don't know, is a chemical that primarily serves in household products such as paint thinner and nail polish remover. Why anyone thinks they might need this much acetone on Vow specifically is still up in the air, but either way, I did find it a little bit eyebrow raising. Whenever you go to turn in scrap at the company building, you'll probably hear a message once the scrap is collected that should sound something like this. Your hard work is invaluable to the company. The thing is though, this is just one example of the various lines that can be emitted over this loudspeaker. There's actually a total of 10 voice lines to be found in the game's code, which vary both in the messages they present, but also in their intonation. We value your commitment. 
Now, while you may have not heard all of these, as some are rarer than others, you might be questioning why I've decided to put this so low down on the iceberg. And truthfully, the reasoning has nothing to do with the voice lines that we hear, but rather the one that we don't. While there are ten lines to be heard, each one following a naming convention of Mike followed by a number, the final of these logs is actually called Mike 11, which is due to Mike 5 being skipped and resulting in a numerical displacement for the rest of the series. This begs the question though, was there ever a Mike number 5? The naming seems to suggest it, but if so, what would it have said, and why is it no longer in the game code? It's an interesting dilemma, but I promise things are only going to get stranger as we continue on to Tier 5. This is the Lasso Man, a creature made of red string that appears within the game's code, but is never used. According to data miners, the Lasso Man's behavior is nearly identical to the Thumper, even patrolling the facility at the same speed, but this is likely unfinished behavior, considering the Lasso Man has never been implemented and was likely scrapped sometime during development. At present, the AI's attack function has absolutely no damaging properties attributed to it, meaning it's hilariously a a technically harmless enemy. Despite being extremely unfinished though, the Lasso Man still has a unique creature ID, making it possible to spawn this thing through limited mod use. Along with that ID, it comes with its own bestiary entry, albeit a only slightly modified version of the entry for the Snare Flea. At present, it's the only unused monster found in Lethal Company. There's one aspect about the moon experimentation, in particular, that makes it a very different place from all of the others which we visit in the game. You see, when you enter a dungeon in Lethal Company, that dungeon itself is generated at the beginning of a round, and is physically located underneath the map. By opening a door, you simply teleport to the floating space, and because of this, the action that's meant to simulate opening a door is actually little more than interacting with a teleporter that simply sends you to the predestined origin point of this maze, and you never actually interact with anything physically inside any of the external facades that we see in-game. In fact, most of the time, if we're to move inside these facilities directly using a free cam, there's little more than empty space to be found here. However, this is not the case on experimentation. Experimentation actually has a fairly comprehensive and complete dungeon layout that is not procedurally generated, not ever used in-game, and is inhabited by zero mobs. In in a normal playthrough, it remains completely inaccessible, but it is right there, just beyond the door that you use to enter the randomized zone. Now, I actually came back to revisit this area while collecting footage for this part of the video, and before we move on, there's one more really intriguing part about this that I want to mention. Ever since discovering it, it's been one of those things that I just can't stop thinking about, and it's so interesting to me, I can't believe that I never saw it sooner. While most of this area is composed of a kind of concrete pallet way up off the ground in the largest room, there's a doorway-sized hole, which leads to an area that looks like a sort of office interior, or has an almost backrooms-esque design. And if you navigate all the way through this section to the other side, you'll find another doorway-sized hole that leads to the outside of the building just behind the fire escape. And this is actually a pretty easy thing to see from the exterior of the building without any hacks, glitches, or exploits at all. It's very visible if you know where to look. If you're anything like me, the thought process right now is probably, well, how can we get in there? But sadly, nothing that I've tried so far has yielded any results. Flying into it with a jetpack doesn't seem to work, there must be some kind of invisible wall here or something like that, but I'll keep you guys posted in the description and the comments if I end up finding a way in. There's a variety of different suits that you can collect throughout Lethal Company by spending credits at the store, the most expensive and prized of which is the pajama suit. But there's also the hazard suit, the green suit, and of course, the decoy suit. But chances are, not many of you have ever even heard of the decoy suit before, and that's because it's never named in-game, but you've definitely seen it. The decoy suit is actually the name of the default orange company jumpsuit, which I think is worth a bit of questioning in its own right. I don't know if anyone was under the impression that the company actually cared about its employees' well-being, but calling your standard uniform a decoy suit really raises some eyebrows. It seems to insinuate that the company isn't actually 
all that concerned with what the employees are doing at all. They're just distractions, meant to draw attention from someone or something else. Inside of the ship, if looking to the left of the terminal, past the area where Sigurd's sticky note appears on the wall, you'll find a poster that looks like this. It advertises some sort of food conservation program, or general information about food conservation and rations, which struck me as odd when I first saw it. I spent some time looking this thing up, and found that this asset is actually a real image licensable for the low price of $20 on Alamy. But interestingly, the poster itself apparently has some historical significance. In-game, due to the art style and cell shading, the poster can be a bit difficult to read, but the clear image reveals that this poster encouraged conservation of surplus food for a war effort. I'm not exactly sure what war in question, but this would have seen display in and around the Pennsylvania area, courtesy of a number of sponsors, such as Community Food Conservation Incorporated and the Navy League Service. The question still remains, though, as to what it's doing on the ship, as this would be a bona fide historical artifact by the year the game takes place, if it wasn't considered one already. But I imagine the answer is probably as simple as Zeekers just feeling like they needed one more decoration for the ship's interior. That's only a guess, though. We talked about going out of bounds using the jetpack on specific moons, but there's actually out of bounds material even when you're not landed on a moon at all. Outside of the ship, most of the world is defined by a black expanse, but there are two rather large orbs that float out here as well, which, fun fact, are these same planets shown in the game's announcement trailer, insinuating that maybe this shot was actually filmed using some developer's tools in this very location. The Fading Nebulae is a term mentioned only once in-game, which is a trend that we're going to see a couple more times before the end of this iceberg. It's referenced in conjunction with the boat, which we talked about earlier as being the vessel which apparently brought Earth life to the Thistle Nebula sometime in the past, and the only real clue as to the area's significance comes from the use of the word nebulae, plural, as opposed to nebula singular. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say that the Fading Nebulae is probably a collection of different nebulas, with Thistle being just one of them. That could be completely wrong, of course, but it does cause you to wonder as to if we'll ever see or hear anything more about the world outside of the Thistle Nebula, because lines like this do sort of suggest that Zeekers may seek to build upon the areas of the Lethal Company universe outside of Thistle sometime in the future. When I first landed on Titan, I thought that maybe I'd actually taken off to the wrong moon. It's hard to deny that this area looks a hell of a lot like the company building, and some theorize that this circumstantial relationship may have a deeper link. We know that the company building houses some kind of eldritch abomination inside, and at this point we also know that this horror probably ate an entire planet. Something like this is going to require a lot more space than just a big concrete slab in the middle of the ocean. But what if the company building wasn't made specifically to house this being to begin with? What if it was formerly used for something completely different, and has since been repurposed to hold its captive? The lore of Titan is that the whole moon used to be host to one big mining facility, with massive tunnels stretching far underground. But just like all of the other moons we visit, they were abandoned sometime prior to our arrival. So, given the similarities between the company building and Titan's external appearance, could it be possible that a vast selection of tunnels that were previously accessible from this platform could be the thing housing the remainder of Jeb's body. Maybe this also alludes to just what kind of creature Jeb is. We've already seen his tentacles, but maybe they're only a small part of a much larger eldritch worm of some kind, like an exceptionally large Earth Leviathan. Or maybe Jeb's true form is more closely akin to one of Lovecraft's old ones. Could this moon once have been a thriving mining world just like Titan? And if so, then what could be haunting all of those tunnels today? Day. With a character as seemingly mysterious as the Ghost Girl, it ought to come as no surprise that many players are left wondering who she is, and whether or not there are multiple of her like most of the other mobs in the game. From the perspective of lore, it's difficult to tell whether the Ghost Girl is one persistent entity across all of the moons on which she's found, or if there's multiple of her. Perhaps one for each location? Additionally, who actually is this? Being the ghost of a young girl seems to suggest that at some point, a 
a human child must have inhabited some of the facilities in which we find her, which is already an odd and mysterious premise when you think about it. After all, who's going to be spending this much time in a place like this as a child? Her appearance in the mansion-style layouts makes a little bit more sense, as once again it almost seems like a reference to the movie The Shining, but her appearance in general really is one of those situations where the more you think about it, the less sense it seems to make. Now it should be noted that on very rare occasions, the ghost girl can spawn multiple times, but this is only something that occurs in fleetingly rare instances, so I'm not confident making any sort of speculation in terms of lore simply based on this mechanic. From what I can tell, there's no mention of a little girl anywhere in Sigurd's logs, in the bestiary entries, or anywhere else in game. So at present, the nature of her existence really is a complete mystery. Here's another entry that's related to something out of bounds, and once again, I feel like I should shout out Alex, or Chicken Nougat, one more time, because without him randomly stumbling across this, I don't know if I even would have found it. We already know that there's a very limited area of the company building which can be explored in vanilla gameplay, but once again, through the magic of free cam, there's a secret set of assets even here. By turning to the right after leaving your ship, and tracing the perimeter of the building way out into the ocean, past where we would usually be able to access, you'll eventually come across a couple of interesting things. First are these player models, which hang above an empty square plane. Models like this actually exist in pretty much every one of the game's environments, even way out of bounds when hovering in space, so this isn't really all too big of a surprise. The more significant addition, however, is a clone of Jeb's window, embedded in the wall just as the original is. These are almost certainly just test assets, but they are pretty neat, and allude to an earlier stage of the game's development that I haven't seen a lot of conversation about online. I assume that I probably don't need to explain the concept of a developer test room to anyone watching. Most games have at least one, many of them are well documented, and a rare few titles even make them accessible, playable parts of the experience. These small chambers can take a number of forms, and are generally used to test physics, player and item interactions, and more while a game is still in development. So it probably won't surprise you to know that Lethal Company has a test room as well. It can be accessed with mods, and I believe it's most easily observable before landing on a moon. The room hosts a large floor platform, a tilted ramp to access and leave the ship, two large concrete pillars, some small outdoor details, and perhaps most interestingly, a test maze, which boasts red, green, and blue colored walls, as well as some basic parts of a dungeon layout, such as a steel grate bridge, and of course, a door. Unlike all of the other dungeons in the game, this area is not procedurally generated, and it really is just meant for the purposes of testing. It's a really cool little space to play around in, and is oddly peaceful in a sense. Just you and a small playground of interactable items floating in the void of space. We started this tier off with a cut enemy type, so why not round it out with a cut item? The binoculars are an obtainable object occupying item number zero, and visually they manifest as a giant pair of, well, binoculars. Being unfinished, it's pretty likely that this item was intended to be scaled down to player size at a later point in time, but if you were to hack them into the game as they are now, they're going to be quite large. It's thought that if implemented, this item would have made it possible to see over a larger distance, which may have proven helpful in outdoor areas. However, it may have been scrapped due to conflictions with how the game renders objects at a distance, or because the use cases weren't as extensive as originally thought. One weird quirk about the binoculars, aside from them being massive, is that when placed on the floor or atop another surface, one lens will always clip through the floor, because apparently the collision for this thing is mounted in the center of the object at a 90 degree angle or something like that. Either way, it's always cool to be able to interact with cut content, even in a limited fashion. But now, we're on to the final layer of this iceberg, and with just five entries, this is Tier 6. 
The ITDA is an authoritative organization of some kind, and it's mentioned in the bestiary entry of the Bunker Spider. I'd wager that pretty much nobody who's even read this entry to begin with has thought twice about the mention of this here, but the truth is that the goals of the organization remain a complete mystery, aside from being somehow related to the population control of certain species within the Thistle Nebula. Most importantly, though, we have no idea what that acronym actually stands for, so it goes down here at the very bottom of the iceberg simply because of the wide-reaching implications from a one-off piece of dialogue. We've mentioned Jess in passing within this iceberg. She's a secondary character and member of Sigurd's crew, but there's an interesting phenomenon that occurs in the game regarding the name Jess, which may or may not be intentional. When we input Jess into the terminal, we get the entry for the Jester. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. I've already said earlier in the iceberg that the terminal only works off of recognizing the first three letters of the input in most instances, so it is overwhelmingly likely that this is simply a result of that same phenomenon. But earlier in time, when there wasn't as much known about this game as there is today, there was a small subset of the community that was convinced that this was actually intentional. There's a fringe belief that survives even now that Jess and the Jester are inexplicably linked in some way, perhaps due to the fact that we never learn of her fate past that final log created by Desmond. It's worth noting that from what I've seen, there's no indication in the game code that Jess has a distinct command, so I wouldn't bank on this theory all too much nowadays, but I would be remiss not to include it here as I think it remains one of the earliest and most strange fringe theories stemming from a time shortly after release, when we didn't know as much about this game as we do today. Trent is an internal name used to refer to the goldfish that can be purchased as a decoration for the ship. Or is it? Well, no, actually, it's not. But if you read the Lethal Company fandom wiki at any point in the past month or so, I don't think you could have been blamed for thinking so. This entry refers to a strange phenomenon that has only recently been wrapped up, in which the goldfish article on the fandom wiki was either intentionally vandalized or mistakenly updated with incorrect information about the goldfish, maybe confusing some of the details with some mod or something like that, I don't know. Either way, some of what was said was pretty out there. Aside from the fish's name being Trent, it was said that the fish must be fed at least once, but no more than twice, per quota, in order to keep it alive. But if the fish was to die, a replacement could be purchased for half the price of the original from the store. Just so we're clear, absolutely none of this is true. There is no replacement fish, there is no fish food, and it was also this article that was responsible for perpetuating the rumor that the fish could be targeted by the ghost girl just the same as a player, which also does not appear true at this time. When I originally wrote down this entry around a month ago, I myself was suckered into thinking that Trent really was the name of the fish, but as the article evolved and got more insane with information that was verifiably false just by booting up the game, the entry instead morphed into talking about this weird microcosm of falsehood that had been spread around on the wiki. With that being said, though, I don't want any anyone watching to derive any sort of anti-Lethal Company fandom wiki sentiment out of this either. At present, there are two wikis that are kind of the main sources of information surrounding the game. One of them is the fandom wiki, and the other is the Mirahees wiki, which, in my opinion, is the preferable of the two sources, but that's really only because of how bad fandom is as a platform. The community itself is, for the most part, quite diligent, and I really do appreciate all of their work, cataloging, data mining, and the like. I know this kind of got off onto a tangent at the end here, but I truly do believe that wikis are an extremely important resource, and the last thing that I want to do is discourage people from engaging with them just because I highlighted an error that I found kind of funny. Both of these wikis will be linked in the description, and I encourage you to go check them out for yourself if you're interested. We're on to our second to last entry in today's video, but paradoxically, this topic stems from probably the most unassuming piece of text in the entire game. The Manticoil is one of only two creature types that are considered completely passive. They're four-winged birds, which share a familial link with corvids, and which can be found in the skies and surface of various moons. Scanning a Manticoil ought to be an easy task, and they're almost always one of the first creatures recorded in any given playthrough. But their bestiary entry holds 
a mystery of its own, nevertheless. Quote, Manticoils mostly feed on small insects, but can also feed on small rodents. They're highly intelligent and social. They pose little threat, and have a generally passive temperament towards humans, although they are capable of transmitting rabies, Rubin Chloria, and pit virus. Well, alright, that sounds all well and good, I suppose, but what the hell is pit virus? And for that matter, what the hell is Rubin Chloria either? Both of these diseases appear to be completely made up and don't appear to have any analogous conditions in our own world. Light Googling revealed no medical results relating to the word Rubin Chloria, and while the word pit virus is somewhat similar to Pitt Hopkins syndrome, I think it would be a bit of a reach to suggest that these two are connected in any way. So, we're left with the names of two diseases that don't actually exist, and which are placed innocuously at the end of a bestiary entry that, were it not for their inclusion, would easily be one of the most banal and unassuming in the whole game. Out of the two, though, I definitely have a lot more interest in pit virus in particular. I don't know, I think it's just the way it's named. It just sounds like something narratively important, and it just seems like such an odd thing to include here if there wasn't some deeper meaning behind it. Earlier in the iceberg, we talked about the moon systems which exist in the world of the game, and how they're connected in-universe using the info segments related to each. Well, this final entry combines that same principle with another that we've already talked about as well, the out-of-bounds of the ship, where you can see two floating celestial bodies. There's something that I didn't talk about with regard to these planet renders earlier on, and it's something that I think only the most eagle-eyed of players would have even noticed at this point, and that is that this is not the only planet render in the game. In fact, there's a couple of them. The model that I've been showing thus far is attributed to the moon's experimentation, assurance, and offense, as well as the company moon Gordian. But there's also this render, if you're focused in on Vow or March, as well as this one, which represents Rend, Dine, and Titan. But that's weird, right? We're not supposed to be able to see any of these things from anywhere within the ship, aren't we? So why do they change? Well, actually, we can see them from within the ship, but only in a very limited fashion. So limited, in fact, that chances are you may have never noticed the difference at all. They're actually picked up on this moving camera, and I have no doubt that this is probably the reason that they're generated or displayed at all. It's such a small, inconsequential piece of world building that I'm not sure anyone else Else I know has picked up on naturally, and I certainly wouldn't have if I hadn't been using mods to get out of bounds for the purposes of earlier entries, such as the segment on the test room. In fact, if you were paying close attention, you may have briefly seen that I was hovering around one of the ice moons when I happened to film the test room part in question, so if you thought that the planet looked a little bit different from how I'd shown it moments before, you wouldn't be wrong, and it's actually because of taking this footage that I even realized the difference in the first place, so to me, at least right now, I believe this may be one of the most obscure pieces of trivia this game has to offer. And with that, at long last, we have finally reached the end of the full Lethal Company iceberg. First of all, thanks to everybody who's still watching. When I started on this project around a month or so ago, I knew it was going to be a long video, but I didn't know it was going to be this long. It's been a lot of fun to make, but I'm definitely ready for a slightly shorter project next time around. There were some big challenges with creating a video of this length that I didn't even consider, like trying to manage and normalize this much audio. That was exceptionally difficult, so I'm sorry if some of the tracks weren't balanced correctly, or if there were abrupt cuts at parts, or if it just sounded great at times. I tried really hard to minimize those areas as best I could, but short of re-recording the whole thing, there kind of comes a point where you have to just roll with what you have, especially given the equipment I've got at my disposal, or lack thereof. For real though, thank you for checking this video out. I really appreciate it, and I hope that you had some fun. Although this video may be over, I think it would be a bit of a shame to let the iceberg simply stagnate. As we all know, this is a game that has and will continue to evolve over time, and so I wanted to ask for the community help in suggesting new entries, organizing the iceberg in the future, and generally just keeping it up to date. I think it's a fun resource, and I'm sure that there's entries that people would have liked to see on here that I didn't have, or things that maybe shouldn't have their own entry and could be lumped in with something else. I don't know. I'm interested to hear what people have to say about it. If you would like to contribute something, then there are two different ways that you can make this happen. The first is probably the obvious one. You can just comment on this video with your ideas, and I'll be reading them over, but you can also 
also use the first link in the description to access the icebergcharts.com page where this chart is hosted. And if you have an account over there, then it is currently flagged for proposals wanted, and I'll be checking in on it every now and again, and taking some of those proposals into consideration for updating the chart. Depending on how things go, or how updates to the game come along, maybe I'll even revisit this sometime in the future, and make a video about the updated iceberg, but probably not for a while, both because the updates to it will no doubt take some time, but also because, damn, I really need a break from thinking about Lethal Company for a while. And speaking of which, I think that's probably all from me for today. Right now, I'm gonna go spend some time outdoors, but needless to say, I'll catch you all again with a fresh new lore video sometime rather soon. With that though, this is Averberon, I'll see you again soon, and have a good one.